Hi, this is Montenero, creator of Death Sentence and writer of comics for Marvel and others. I'm here to talk about Death Sentence Liberty, uh, the new Kickstarter that you can find live at the moment. And you're listening to this here on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented artist, writer, and creator of an amazing comic called Death Sentence. Uh, this is his first time on the show. We're joined by the ever-talented Monty Nero. How are you doing today, Monty? Yeah, great. Good to see you. To be perfectly honest, I had never seen any of your work until death sentence to be perfectly honest uh i i unfortunately i don't read many comics these days because of the show and prepping for interviews and all that other stuff but from what i've seen with death sentence what i've seen with writing and, and the art style that you've created with this i love it the fact that i had to even back it so i could read the entire thing showcases how much i i'm invested now in this amazing comic so congratulations on on getting it funded so quickly as well too oh thank you Cheers. For those that don't know anything about Death Sentence or yourself, tell us what it's all about. Right. Well, it's the comic that I got into comics to make. It's about an STD that gives you weird powers but kills you in six months. It's all tied in towards the things that you're naturally good at. And you've got basically six months um, to sort of fulfill yourself with these sort of strange powers that the virus gives you. And it's not just about that. It's about it's really the style and the tone of the storytelling, which is quite adult, um, but also very sort of very affecting and sort of dramatic and um, um, cool. I uh, would get frustrated with a lot of comics, just the way the story was told and the sort of the lack of believability or the lack of respect towards the sort of reality of the characters' lives and you know what they're going through and stuff. I just wanted to make something that was a bit more relatable really to like <clears throat> ordinary people maybe is why why you you backed it is because you know you sort of you see it and then it looks interesting and then you look into it a bit more and it just seems to have something a little different about it that's what i always wanted to try and do and uh, people seem to relate to that they seem to they seem to people that like it really 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 like it and uh got quite a lot of you know long-term fans that have um been with us from like the very first um comic so then what are some of the themes that spoke to you when you were first creating this series it was mainly about obviously the whole dying thing and having six months left to kind of make something of your life or to do something with your life it kind of condenses the whole the whole situation we're all in you know with our lives you know we, we, our lives unfold if we're lucky over sort of 80 90 years but we've got a, you know figure out what we're going to do with ourselves and survive and, and uh, hopefully thrive, find something that fulfills us. It just condenses that whole down, that whole situation down to sort of six really dramatic um, stylized months. It just seemed a very relatable kind of um, issue at the time. And looking back as well, I started making the book around about the time that um, my wife got pregnant. And I, I, I realized that we were going to be starting a family and I, I needed to sort of... Um, you know, buckle down and look after the family and make sure I was bringing enough money to raise this child. And I think I had it in my mind that I only had sort of like a six months, eight months left to kind of do something a little bit crazy and maybe try and do a comic, which is my thing, before I had to be a bit more kind of responsible and stuff. So, so that was kind of a big part of the motivation and the, the uh, emotions I was sort of going through as I was writing it. Um, and it kind of translated, I think, to the characters and the situation they're in. Though, of course, it's all heightened in the in the comic because they're they're going to die in six months. Um, and of course, having a child is a, is a wonderful thing, and it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to us. And um, luckily, as well, the comic was really successful, so I didn't have to sort of do a more boring job. I just did more comics after after um, um, our daughter was born. So. Um, yeah, it turned out turned out well. I was quite quite surprised. I didn't expect the comic to be something that you could actually sort of 
you know, um, earn a living out of. So that was a that was a nice surprise. Then, as a as a writer and artist and a creative person that you are, does this type of creativity energize you, or does it drain you uh, in your life? Oh yeah, yeah, massively, massively energizing. I've always done sort of things relating to art or writing for a career. It's almost worse in some ways when you're doing you're working on some sort of corporate project project that's very kind of uh, bureaucratic and it's all focus group focus groups and market testing and you kind of you start off with a great idea and then it's all all the edges get knocked off it and so many people have an input into it and you end up spending sometimes years working on it and you, by the end of it you just feel like even though you did all the artwork in it you don't feel like it's anything like to do with you in the end you just feel sort of um you know, you obviously, you know, it's great. It's, you're getting paid to make something. So I was always very grateful to be working and to do something artistic for a living. But um, you don't feel that it's yours or it's an expression of you or anything. So I think the great thing about comics, even though they're hard, they're hard to make. And, you know, the pay is nowhere near as good. They are, it's just really energizing to be able to make something that's says something about you and the world and the way you see the world and, you know, makes people laugh and, uh, you know, makes people cry as uh, has happened with people that have read the final kind of chapters of Death Sentence. It's just a really um, energizing thing. And especially I've done some writing and I've done some art, but I'd never been able, before I did comics, I'd never been able to do them both at the same time. I think to be able to do that as well, I find very energizing because when I get fed up, you know, a bit tired of um, drawing and painting, I can always just go and write a script for like a week. Um, and when I get tired of writing scripts, I can go and do some covers. So so the two things kind of, kind of like fire off each other and they inter interlink as well because the drawings and pictures you're doing give you ideas for dialogue and then the scenes you're writing give you ideas for visuals and and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, it is, it is very, it, it's a great, it's a great job. Looking at the the world that you've created with Death Sentence, though, what did you draw from to make that world a reality? Looking back on it, it's probably, again, coming back to this thing of um, settling down and having a family, it's probably like an expression of everything I'd gone through as an adult uh, prior to that, like all the experiences I'd had, all the funny people that I'd met, all the kind of weird situations sex, drugs, rock and roll, um, all that kind of stuff, all kind of condensed and kind of satirized, really, because it's it's very black, it's very funny, uh, it's quite dark sometimes, but it is very real, and people kind of really relate to it, I think, uh, in terms of recognizing parts of their own life and characters they know. So it's probably, looking back, it was probably, probably that. You also have a great cast of characters as well, too. Um, name name creation is always interesting to to see from a creative perspective because who knows where certain names come from. But for your characters, and you have some really interesting names as well, too, how did you come up with those? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the way I work is I paint the characters first. I design mm. the characters because that's what, that's what I was doing before I did comics. I was designing characters. Um, so I painted the characters and designed the characters first. And as you're doing that, you're, it took me a while because I was striving very much to get a very particular kind of rock and roll, nihilistic kind of feel, something that looked different to anything that I'd seen in comics before at that time. And as you're doing that, and you're sort of striving to get this feeling, just certain names, dialogue and names pop into your head, and you just sort of write them down as, you, as you're painting and drawing. Um, and then you go through them and you obviously choose, you know, the best ones, the best scenes for the dialogue and the best, the best names. Weasel and um, Verity, they, Verity uh, is the main character. Um, she's um, like a graphic designer, but she wants to be an artist. So she's sort of struggling when she catches the virus. She's quite promiscuous. She's in her sort of mid-twenties. Yeah, Verity Fair just seemed like the right name weasel i know a guy called weasel you know from when i was like in my teens i just thought it was a cool name and he was uh, quite a similar character to the the character in the in the comic weasel's a, a rock and roll star but he's like a bit of a fraud he's kind of got the 
image and the looks and the attitude, but he hasn't really got the talent. From that point of view, getting the virus and potentially being able to develop some some real talents is kind of quite exciting for him. And then Monty, yeah, I really tried hard to give Monty a different name because Monty is obviously, you know, my name right in the book. And Monty's a really horrible character. <laughs> he's like really awful. He's very, very funny, but he's an awful, awful character. And obviously if you call a character the same name as you in the comic, people say like, oh, he is you. And he's, not, he's nothing like me. He's, you know, he's uh, very different to me, but it just seemed the right name for the character. And I, I tried really hard to give him different names and I wrote scripts with different names in them. And it just, it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't have the right feel so um yeah. switched it back to monty and it does suit him it does suit him very well as far as this kind of aristocratic luke kind of comedian that's uh very very naughty looking back at everything that you've created in in your career not just with death sentence though when was the first time you learned that language had power probably very early on i mean that's why you want to be a writer isn't it because you realize language has power I always loved writing stories and the response I'd get from stories. And I was lucky in one sense in the, like the primary school I went to, they were very encouraging and they'd let me spend all day writing stories. And then someone would say, oh, this is really good. And they'd read them out to the rest of the class or something. So you think like, oh, I'm good at this. And if you get a bit of encouragement at that age, you can, you sort of like, you know, it's kind of exponential, isn't it? You keep writing. And, and then when you get older, you start learning about it. So you study Everything that's a lot of stuff about stories, you can learn like you're doing maths, like, you know, how to develop a story and how to take an idea and turn it into a story and how to, you know, develop a satisfying character arc that, you know, interweaves with each of your characters um, through the story and they all have a satisfying kind of arc to their exploits. You can study all that stuff and learn it, which I really did in my sort of late teens and early 20s. Mm. got into sort of like screenwriting and, and entering sort of screenplay competitions and I was lucky enough to sort of win a prize in one of them and then get one of my scripts optioned and sort of try and de develop it as a TV show and, and stuff like that. So, um, and then with comics, the beauty of it is that it's even more powerful than words on their own, isn't it? Because you've got the imagery with the words. So it's like all, you know, you, you, you're, you're, your senses in your brain, your visual storytelling, and then the, the verbal from the text. Um, together, they're very complementary and they're very powerful and they can sort of intermingle in really interesting ways that I, I find really stimulating. It just sort of, when I read a good comic that really is told well, it really, you know, there's nothing better. So I think because it uses the visual imagery and also the words, if it's done right, I think it is the most powerful form of storytelling. It's so direct and um, so stimulating because the reader has to, you know, do so much of the work. It's not like a movie where everything's just spoon fed to you. Um, it's all happening in your head and you're kind of inspiring people to have these kind of emotions through the imagery and, and the text. So, so uh, yeah, it's just a great, and then similar to writing, you just think, oh, there's, oh, you know, I enjoy doing this and I seem to be quite good at it and I really want to do a comic one day. So then you think like, well, just going to have to go for it at some point. So that's what I did with Death Sentence. You know, just started making it in my in my bedroom for my own amusement and thinking like I'd put out like you know I think initially I printed fifty copies. So um, it all sort of grew from there because luckily people really liked it. Obviously, having a great team around you is, is a wonderful way to have a collaborative effort when it comes to creating this amazing comic as well too who else has been working with you for the longest to create death sentence yeah i was very very lucky in um the co-creator of death sentence which is an artist called mike dowling who uh, is currently drawing spider-man um prior to that he was working on black cat he's done some image tiles and 2000 AD stuff. We actually met at a comic con where we both sort of had portfolios of artwork, you know, and you're sort of showing them to people at the con. He was in the queue in front of me and he was showing someone his artwork and the guy didn't really rate his artwork. And I just thought that was fucking mental because like his art, his art was incredible. I was like, Jesus, this guy is a fucking genius. And I'm like, oh, I've got to follow this guy. And like my portfolio is not as good as his. And he's already got kind of like, 
short shrift off this editor. So instead of talking to the editor, I talked to Mike and I just started chatting to him and saying, you know, how good I thought his work was. And we kind of got friendly and exchanged details. And then um, I think after that, I had like a short story, like a three page story that I'd written. I got in touch with him to see if he'd draw it. You know, I was going to pay him you know, like a proper page rate. But he was too busy because obviously being really talented and he was, you know, very busy with work. He wasn't able to draw that. Um, but then he was working on something with a comedian called um, Frankie Boyle, like a, a graphic novel that subsequently been finished and came out. But what happened was because Frankie Boyle is a comedian and he's, you know, very rich and he earns a lot of money from um, TV shows and uh, touring. He sort of got halfway through the script and then he just stopped doing it and went and did, you know, his comedian stuff. So Mike was just screwed. He just had, he was thinking like I had like, you know, a year's worth of work here and he just suddenly found that he had nothing because the scripts just dried up. So I just said like, well, I've got this, uh, I've got a script for death sentence. Do you want to have a look at it? And if you like it, we can do it together and I'll pay you like the proper rate. Luckily he loved it. And that was great because he did such an amazing job of the storytelling. It's one thing having ideas and describing them and, you know, writing the story in the dialogue, but then to actually make it into a brilliant comic, that's the genius of having a really great comic artist working, you know, with you. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, any comic is is half you and half the artist and then and, and the other collaborators, um, you know, the colorist and the, the letterer as well, all, all integral parts of what make it good or not. So, so you have to um, really work as a team now, obviously, you're successful as as a creative person, as an artist, as and as a writer. But what was the first thing that you wrote that you thought, yes, I could do this as a career? That's a good question. Um, I think it's always, it's always hard to uh, have a career as a writer. I mean, it's something that a lot of people want to do. It's obviously very competitive, so you know that makes the working environment not not very good there's loads of people who want to do something and they're willing to put up with stuff then that makes it hard for you to sort of get into that field so i mean i had lots of things where i was getting paid to write it never seemed really that i should give up my job and go into it full time even when i was like getting paid to develop this um screenplay into a film i just thought this is way too kind of tenuous and nebulous and so, so much chance is involved in whether you get funding or not, whether you get greenlit or not. Yeah, and when you've got bills to pay and stuff, it's uh, it's very hard to go into that. So I guess a lot, I, I think it's quite good advice, actually, or good practice anyway, is if you're a writer, an artist, and you want to do that, doing it full time isn't necessarily a good idea because if you do it full time for a start, you can't do the stuff you want to do. If you've got another job and then you've got time to sort of write and draw as well, so maybe it's a part-time job, you know. That means that gives you a little bit of independence to actually make the stuff that you want to make. And I think it's very important in any creative field to be able to say no to people and to be able to tell them when an idea is dumb. Um, and if you haven't got the financial independence to do that because this is your only income and you have to just go along with it, then you end up writing all kinds of rubbish. That's not good. So I think... Probably the, the only time when I thought, like, oh, yeah, I, could, I should definitely do this as a career is when Death Sentence took off. After the first issue, Marvel got in touch with me and said, do you want to you know, pitch some ideas to us? And I just thought, well, Marvel getting in touch, then maybe there's a career here, you know? So um, I did send them some, some ideas and, and they picked up on a couple of them and, and we sort of ran with it. But I think ultimately I realised from that experience, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do comics like Death Sentence. I mean, that was what really got me excited. And uh, having that creative freedom and, and uh, self-expression and um, doing something that you really believe in, I think that's really what fires my engines. And increasingly, that's the way the kind of field of comics has gone, hasn't it? Where you get more and more and more creator-owned creator stuff nowadays, whether it comes out through image or it comes out through crowdfunding or maybe both at the same time. Increasingly, the way the world's going is people are much, it's much easier for like artists and writers to do their own thing and then to somehow get it to people in a way that they can make a living from it. Technology has kind of opened that up over the last sort of 10, 15 years. So, and that's a great 
trend and you, you, you know, it often blows my mind to think like, wow, if Jack Kirby had been alive now, you know, what would he have created as far as his own universe with something like, you know, crowdfunding or, or create our own comics? It would just be mind blowing, you know, his family and him, he'd have been able to, you know, reap the full rewards of his talent. So yeah, I always feel very lucky to be alive in this time because, you know, I haven't got a hundredth of the talent of Jack Kirby, but I'm able to sort of, you know, at least make a living, you know, making my own stuff. Are you an avid reader? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I read a hell of a lot. Comics and novels, mm, a lot of um, nonfiction, because a lot of the time you sort of say that it's research, but it's just things you're interested in that you love reading around, especially sort of like historical, you know, situations or interesting life stories. I'm always, I mean, I read, you know, a couple of books a week easily. And then comics, you know, I'm always reading comics, whatever. You can read comics anywhere now. You can read, I mean, I get comics. Um, I love to get a physical comic or a graphic novel. I love to have it in my hands. But at the same time, I read a lot of digital stuff on my phone or on my tablet, you know, just in moments, odd moments when you're sort of waiting to get a bus or, you know, you're in the bathroom or something. You can just you can just uh, try something. And I find with that, I try things that I would not normally buy. So I'm more experimental. I try things, not often they're rubbish, but often you find something really really amazing that you didn't know about kickstarter you can uncover some real real gems there's a there's a couple of real interesting kind of creators working working through crowdfunding at the moment and then like mainstream comics you know i tend to follow writers um and artists rather than characters because i think everybody knows that you know you might like the hulk but it's going to be a very different hulk under you know, one writer like Peter David than it is under another writer like Al Ewing or something. Both are good, but they're very different. So I tend to follow particular kind of writers um, and artists. So I was very, I read Venom, Venom 1 this morning, just because, you know, I've always loved Brian Hitch and the detail and the passion and the amount of effort and, and the, the sort of sense of reality that he brings to the, to the worlds that he creates um, in the comics. And then you know, Al Ewing's one of my favorite writers. So the two of them together, I just, you know, ordered that straight away. As a creative person, this can be for, as a writer or as an artist, what is your kryptonite? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't have a lot of tolerance. I think the reason why, I think the reason why I got into comics was because I don't like, increasingly as I got older, I don't like working with bluffers and people that really don't get it you know, creatively. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people in the entertainment field that are just in it to sort of make money. And, and they don't really understand either the writing or the art, really. They just sort of, they, they, they look around and they see what's hot and they kind of go with that. And they kind of like, you hear them sort of parrot things that other people have said as far as like what should be done in any situation. And it gets quite wearing when they're in sort of positions of influence because often, say, in computer games, where I used to work in computer games, often a lot of the people that are ultimately making the decisions are sort of, you know, executives and they're not creative people. They don't really understand the creative kernel of what, what it is that's being made and how it, how it needs to be made to succeed. And they just do everything based on you know, focus groups and, and market forces and what's been what's been popular in the past, which is, of course, you know, no guide to what is going to be popular in the future. You know, if you want to make something original and great, looking at what's popular in the past isn't going to help you because you need to understand the market and give it what it needs next before it even knows it needs it next because you've got to make it in advance, if you see what I mean. So looking backwards all the time, really kind of... Um, you know, it's tiring after a while. Um, but that's the great thing about creator own comics is you can just, you can have an idea, pretty crazy idea, then you can make it exactly as you want it. And then it's not a long, long winded process. There's only maybe two or three of you involved in that process. And then you put it out and people either do or don't go for it. So it's a very sort of quick way to have ideas and to make them into a reality. And I think that's what's exciting about being creative is you have an idea and you, you make it into something real. That is satisfying. Um, and comics are great for that because it's so 
relatively quick to do that and you don't have to go through loads of meetings and you don't have to get loads of funding and you don't have to get the approval of great bodies of people that always kind of want to have an input and knock all the edges off it so that by the end of it it's not what you wanted it to be it's not a pure raw kind of exciting thing anymore it's kind of like a bit more homogenous that's probably a big part of why i work in comics these days do you think we can never be happy as a creative person mm. oh absolutely Absolutely. I know what you mean from the sense of you're always striving for more and you're always striving to sort of capture something that is in your head and it's never quite what you felt or imagined um, when it actually is realized on paper. But I think a big part of being creative is managing that process and just understanding that nothing is ever going to be 100% what you purely imagined it would be at the very beginning. Part of that is because you couldn't imagine the entirety of it. You only imagined sort of something exciting about it that seemed very powerful and you've got to try and capture that put it into the work i'm always very good at like writing that down and having that be the core of everything that i work around and always coming back to that and not lose it sometimes when you develop a story you get away from that core exciting thing that got you really enthused about it because you're thinking like oh this would be the better story but you've always got to come back to that core exciting thing that got you excited and make sure that's in the comic or in the story and because that's what's going to get other people excited and then trying to realize that so you, you communicate it visually and then in the first few pages of the comic because if you don't do it in the first few pages people will kind of get bored and wander off is is challenging and it's there's a lot of process in that there's a lot of like craft and you know you can practice and get better at it but yeah it's all about good storytelling ultimately visually and you know through the text to to it, kind of capture that exciting wonderful idea that you had at the beginning and i think maybe as i've got older i've just got better at uh, i've just got into situations i put myself in situations more where i'm making things that i'm very happy with if you're happy with what you're making then it's just wonderful you know you're, you're just it's really exciting it kind of energizes itself and it doesn't feel like work and you don't really get tired even though your back's hurting and you've done long hours because comics is always long hours. It's not a physical tiredness. It's like tiredness is more mental. You see that in kids. They say like they're completely exhausted and they're really sad and sulky. And they'll see like a, a, a play park and they'll just suddenly have loads of energy and run, run off and they'll play for an hour. An hour before that, they couldn't, you know, walk. They weren't, they weren't lifting. They were so tired. And it's because they're sort of mentally just tired and mentally bored. And if you're enthused and excited by what you're doing, then you don't get tired and you don't get fed up. You just, you can keep, keep going. Yeah. I think that's key to it. You touched on the theme of, of death uh, early on and how we only have a finite amount of time in, in our general lives to begin with. Mm. What is, what is one thing that everyone should do before they die? Mm. Oh, yeah. I think tell the people that you love, uh, how you feel about them, really, and also just be just be good to people. I find that increasingly as I've got older, when I've looked back on my life, I don't really have any regrets, but there's a couple of times where, like, say I had an argument with a friend that got really heated and there was no need for it and we sort of fell out and didn't talk. That's the sort of thing that would happen, like, in my sort of teens and early 20s. And I think you just wish that, that had never happened and there was no need for that to happen and you wish you were still sort of friends so i think yeah just be honest with people and be good to people and i think that's the most important thing in life and yeah you don't want to you don't want to die and regret not not letting people know how you felt about them really yeah i haven't asked that question before so I was yeah that's curious. A good, good question in one sentence who are you i'd say father husband creative person that's probably who i am now in that in that order you know father and husband first and equally and then creative person has a sort of adjunct to that and i've got i'm lucky in that the my wife and my family they're very much very supportive and understanding of the creative life that i lead and you know that can lead to some strange hours and um, we could earn, i could earn a lot of money if i went back into i could earn a lot more money if i went back into computer games and did that sort of work but I'm much happier doing the sort of work that I do now and it brings in enough to sort of pay the bills. So, um, and my wife is just like, she's totally hundred percent behind that. She's, she wants me to be happy. She'd rather I was happy. I mean, she remembers what it was like the, the last sort of few years of working in computer games where I was just so burnt out 
like creatively it's like you were saying i well like we were saying earlier i guess and that I, yeah there were long hours but they weren't any longer hours than i work now it was just a fact that i didn't believe in what we were making and i was just burnt out by the whole process of it all that was so repetitive and you could see the same mistakes and problems coming like, years down the line and they'd still happen but and it just gets wearing after a while and you get tired so i think from that point of view she's just totally um happy that i'm happy doing what i'm doing now and you know she can do what she does and our daughters uh, the good thing about comics work as well is you can work from home so you're always there for your kids so you know you can pick them up from school and you can take them to swimming club and of course you end up having to work like you know five hours after they've gone to bed because you've been doing all these other things during the day but that's fantastic i mean that's priceless to me that's that's worth any amount of money. The fact that you're actually around to spend time with your kids while they're young. That's always what I wanted in life, you know, to have a family and to do that sort of stuff. That was my big sort of, one of my main aims. So um, I feel very lucky to be able to do that. So then as a, as a creative person, as a writer and artist there, how has family changed your style of writing and being an artist? Yeah, it's an interesting one. It does make you think, I think having a young child, it does make you think a lot more about the future and what kind of world they're going to grow up in. And you get very angry about all the things that aren't right about the world now that they're going to have to deal with. And you think, like, well, why can't we just fucking fix this stuff now and do something about it now? And then they wouldn't have to go through all this shit when they're older. So from that point of view, I guess it does inform your work a little. But at the same time, I'm very much like, I know the sort of stuff that I'm into. and I know what gets me excited and I don't really... I don't want to compromise on that at all. So um, at the moment, I mean, obviously my daughter's quite a bit older now than she was, but she's still never read any of my comics because they're not for kids, they're for adults. She read, she read the Marvel stuff. That's somebody else's characters. You know, my, my comics are like still very much the pure kernel of what I was wanting them to be. And they're for people that are 18 and over, so it hasn't changed anything. The Kickstarter obviously is is 100% funded, so congratulations on that. It's amazing. There's As of this recording, there's 18 days left. What did you want to do differently with this campaign compared to other Kickstarter campaigns that you've done in the past to kind of showcase your talents? Okay, well, firstly, with this campaign, I've got the whole entirety of Death Sentence available. And that's the first time I've done that. So you can read the very first to the very last across sort of three graphic novel length stories. So I think that's exciting and people seem to be really going for those kind of levels, get the whole story. I think that's nice when you get through your letterbox, just a complete story that's really, really good and you can read the whole thing. I think that's, that's, that's a great thing to, to spend your money on. The other thing is just because of the last year that we've all had with like all the problems that have been in the world, there's, you know, it's been an awful time. And then, Oh, as a knock-on of that, there were all these kind of practical problems with supply and shipping and stuff. So I just wanted to keep it really simple and make sure that whatever happens, you know, I can print and ship this book inside three months so that, um, you know, I didn't run the campaign until we got everything finished. There were five pages left to finish when we started. So that means that by the time the campaign ends, you know, we'll be, we'll be ready to go to print. So really wanted to focus on making sure that I can get everybody their stuff in a good amount of time. Cause I think that's an important part of the deal with Kickstarter comics is you, you want to get the, the stuff in a, in a timely way. That's very much what I want to focus on going forwards is like sort of having a sort of three, four months, three or four months turnaround for every, every campaign and every project as far as getting stuff to people. It takes a lot of focus and discipline because I can spend a lot of effort marketing the, kickstarter and i could probably get thousands extra if i did that but to me that's not as valuable as actually spending my days finishing the pages and the art and the lettering and making sure that the people that have backed it already get get what they've paid for so so that's what i'm focusing on i don't want to get lost in the selling the selling the kickstarter and and uh, checking the sort of page and stuff like that i want to just carry on working on it and, and getting it ready for print. That way we can get people the comic, they can enjoy the comic, and then I can run another Kickstarter, and then and then we can get another comic out in the same kind of timely way. Yeah, Kickstarter is like a second job, literally, for some people. It's just 30 days of 
throwing yourself to the wolves and putting your yourself out there saying, hey, look at what I've yeah, and I think it can be quite addictive to people as well. It's kind of like social media in a sense, but instead of click, you get like money. So I think some people get actually addicted to it. So yeah, I'm quite good at just, you know, I'll do an update or send a couple of tweets or something, but then I'll just put my phone away and I'll work on the comic for eight hours and then um, maybe have another look before I go to bed. But I think that's the way to do it. Otherwise, you can go a bit mad kind of um, worrying and fretting over it and um there's always something you can do to get extra extra backers or extra money. But I think, like I said, it's more valuable for everybody to just get the comic finished and ship it. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Um, that's a good question. Yes. I do get inspired by writers a lot in um, prose and in comics. And I think... Definitely something very inspiring about comic book pages and comic book art. It just sort of speaks to you on a really primal level. And it's very powerful. And I think that's why I wanted to make comics because, you know, you're reading these comic pages. They don't necessarily have to be like the best comics in the world, but there's certain pages that just stick in my head or certain moments from comics that stick in my head really vividly from when I was a kid. I think because it's, it looks quite simple because it's like, you know, drawings and text. You think, oh, I could do that. And that's a big mistake because it's, it's, it, does, it looks easy and it's not easy. It's really hard. And I think as soon as anybody tries to make a comic, they suddenly go, oh, Jesus, this is like a lot of work. I tried to make my dad like a six-page comic for his birthday once and I only got two pages done because it's just like, wow, a lot of, a lot of work. And then when I was about 17, I had been making like comics and comic pages, like short comics and stuff. I got a place on um, a place called the London Cartoon Centre, which was taught by David Lloyd, who drew V Vendetta. So, you know, a very great comic artist. And uh, I would go to classes every week and um, he would give me scripts and then I would draw them and he would critique them every week and that was a fantastic learning experience because well firstly you, you just realize how crap you are at it you know you think you're good at it and then <clears throat> when you have to draw a script that someone else has written it's very different to drawing your own stuff when you can just sort of change things to sort of suit your style or to suit what you want to draw that day so and then you'd avoid things that are difficult to draw often when you're just making your own comics when you're a teenager I think I've got a lot to thank David Lloyd for a very great artist and very generous with his time because, you know, I was one of many, you know, probably hundreds of students that he helped at that time. So him, Dave Gibbons as well. I've always been a big fan of Dave Gibbons and I've been lucky enough to sort of meet him and get to know him a little and um, to have some sort of friendly interactions with him sort of socially. You know, he's actually got a link to the city where I'm from and he's come to the city a few times. I actually helped him find his um, father's old home in the, in the city where he used to live and he was so delighted. He was just absolutely chuffed. He sort of wrote to all his relatives and saying like, we found the house, all this kind of stuff. So, and he's always been very friendly, very helpful, very supportive and very inspiring dude, you know, because he's a great, again, a great storyteller and artist, but also just a really lovely guy, a really sound bloke. People like that definitely, definitely inspire me. I was going to ask then, what were the some of the comic pages that kind of stuck in your mind that just you always kind of draw, go back to creatively? Yeah, that's a good question. Odd things. So like random pages from like, I used to read this uh, comic called Buster, which is a British newsstand humor title, but it had a sort of two page um, adventure strip in it called The Leopard from Lime Street. So the leopard from Lime Street is basically the British version of Spider-Man. So he's like a leopard rather than a spider. And he's sort of, it's the same setup. You know, he's living with his uncle rather than his aunt. And, you know, he's uh, scratched by a radioactive leopard. And then he can leap about on rooftops and solve crimes and stuff. And um, the art is, is really good. And I think that was the first, I think what, the reason why that spoke to me is because when you're younger and you live in Britain and you're reading all these American comics, the cities and the environments look totally alien to you because they're nothing like 
the country that we live in. And it was always the worst. The absolute worst was when you'd get American artists trying to draw Britain and it would just be so wrong and it would be really, really upsetting and off-putting and just surreal. They'd try and draw like British kind of streets and British pubs and British phones and cars and stuff and it would just look really freaky and do British accents as well, which they often seem to have a problem with. But when they're drawing American stuff, when American artists are drawing American stuff or, you know, a space or fantasy, it looks amazing and it really works because, you know, to us as kids growing up in the UK, reading American comics, the whole thing, the whole situation, New York just seems like another fantasy city that can't possibly exist in real life. It's just so, you know, in- incredible. And, you know, even when I went to New York when I was older, I just couldn't literally believe that those buildings are actually that tall. And they do actually all have like the little water coolers on the top and all that stuff John Romita was drawing. That's what New York looks like. And I just thought it was like some artistic license to make sure that Spider-Man had something to attach his webs to and stuff. Yeah, that page, those sort of, those pages from Leopard from Lime Street really struck a chord with me. And the way the character moved, um, you know, seemed to have this kind of balletic grace and leap from car to car and rooftop to rooftop. That sort of stuff really stuck with me. And you want to sort of figure out how to do that and how to sort of create that impression yourself. And that's also what I loved about Spider-Man was like the movement of the character. I think that's the best thing about the character is he's just got this incredibly unique way of moving and it's very intoxicating. You know, you can just be like, you know, moving across the city, you know, doing some expositionary kind of like thought bubbles. But because of the way he's moving and the sort of visuals, it just it's just exciting and inspiring. Stuff like that, Asterix, which is a humor comic, just the timing of the comedy and the physical comedy. I, I put that in a lot of my comics and because it's drawn in a completely different style and it's very sort of mature and dark and sort of gritty, even though it is still funny, people don't notice the link because it just, it's just was all about timing and what you put in the first panel and what's in the second panel and how things move across the space of the panel. I think a lot of that timing comes from like Asterix comics. I remember the first time I saw comics taken seriously by adults was when like the Dark Knight was in like the Sunday magazine supplement that my dad would get. And it was like, it was on the cover and it was also sort of, there was a story inside and it just sounded like the most amazing thing. So something I should definitely get. But it was just the fact that it was in like uh, all this stunning kind of like um, artwork was in like a newspaper, not like a comic magazine or a sort of anything that was aimed at younger people. It was, and, you know, just the the style and the power of the pages at that time i think his work at that time was incredibly innovative and powerful the the coloring and the inking you know the people he was working with the whole thing just really worked really fantastically well so those pages definitely stick with me first time i saw mazzuccelli you know just his storytelling just just blew me away and this ability to capture the exact right moment and expression and you know, the exact right contents of the panel to tell the story at that moment it really kind of, really kind of had a big impact on me, I think. It's it's amazing how, you know, we draw inspiration from different visual mediums. Like for me, I, I went back to university for visual uh, visual arts and film with a background in computers. Like I have, I have a background in computer science. Oh, yeah. But I completely flipped everything to you know, pursue video production and and everything like that with the show. And I studied visual arts and film and minored in computer science at university. Oh, cool. And so learning about composition, light, shadow, color theory, Mm. um, not only with, uh, from, from the masters in the art world from early, early on to present day, but to see it in film as well, how that was reflected back and forth, it was, was pretty amazing. And then to see it in comics as well, mm. you know, just that nice, amazing blend of, of motion, like you said, with Spider-Man as well, too, and The Dark Knight and all that other stuff. And it's just, it just, it uh, expands the mind pretty, yeah. pretty amazingly. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's... Uh, it- a lot of it, like you say, you can learn. You can learn about the theory and the practice of it, the craft of it. A lot of creative stuff you can't learn because it's to do with, you know, individuality and personality and 
spontaneity and originality and things. But um, a lot of these things you can learn. I remember being so angry when I realized that color theory was just something you could learn and you could learn to paint any color and you could mix any color and you could, it was just like doing maths. You just put this with this and you get this. And like, I'd been to like five years of art lessons and no one had mentioned this. No one had thought to mention that actually you can mix any color just by doing these things. Yeah. And he's just like, well, why would you not teach kids in an art class that? It just, it, and it's like, oh no, let's let people express themselves. Yeah, let people express themselves, but give them the tools to do it. You know, give them the knowledge to do it. And so I just went and got a lot of books and just started realizing that perspective and, you know, composition and, and painting and color theory, these are all things that people have done for centuries and they've written down how to do it and you can learn it. You can study. So uh, that's what I did. And uh, then that gives you the freedom to express yourself in a way that is satisfying. From a professional perspective, you have created amazing works. You've created Death Sentence. You've worked in uh, for Marvel. You've done amazing works in that regard as well, too. And you are continuing to create Death Sentence and, and other works as well that I'm sure we'll see in the future. So professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, but all to do with like personal stuff. Just, you know, I've been with the same, I've been married now for like, you know, getting on for 13 years and, you know, my daughter's very happy. So that sort of thing, I think you can take pride in as a father and as a, as a family. And obviously you do it together, you do it, you're all working together, but uh, I take more, pr I take pride in that. I think um, creatively, it's great to do something that you're happy with and to, to get paid for it. So I know that's a, a wonderful situation. So it gives me sort of contentment and I, I realize how lucky I am to be able to do that. Um, but to me, like there are thousands and millions of people that are more talented than me uh, creatively, you know, writing and art. So um, I, I just, I just, I put a lot of effort into it to make something that I can be genuinely proud of. And it's, absolutely the best thing that it can be and that's what i like to see in any sort of creative whether it's a book or a comic i want to see people bringing their a game really knocking it out of the park putting everything into it and unfortunately due to the practicalities of you know uh, production line comics you know uh, a lot of times you don't get that even when the people are talented the comic is kind of sort of a half of what it could have been so, so I think that's why creator own comics are so great is because you get things that people are really putting their heart and soul into and that they're really passionate about and you can kind of read them undiluted. And it's like sort of like having a sort of blast straight from the back of their brain and their imagination right into your, your own brain. And that's, that's really exciting, I think, uh, with comics. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I think everybody fails. I think that's the thing to remember, especially when you're a younger man. I think it's very easy to tie your uh, personal sense of self-esteem to like how well you're doing in your job or how much money you're earning. I think guys, I think everybody is prone to that, but I think guys in particular. So I guess as I've got older, I've just learned to just, you know, take the long view and to take the, the rough with the smooth and to understand that not everything you do is going to work out. And as long as you just, all you've got to do is trust the process. And as long as you're getting up every day, you're like focused, you're putting 100% into the art and the writing and you're happy with it at the time that you did it, it was the best that you could do that day in whatever circumstances you might be in. Sometimes they're you know, not good circumstances. You've just got to, that's what being a professional is, you've just got to do the best you can on that day with the art, that panel, that particular thing. And then um, as long as you've done that, then you can always just look back on it as a learning experience. And it's very important to listen to feedback, listen to what people are telling you about what they thought of something you made, reflect on it, and then make sure that the next time you do something, you don't make those mistakes. And I think, um, you know, I did that a lot in my 20s in particular. You know, every time 
I'd, I'd try and make comics and they just wouldn't be very good and I'd be amazed. I think they were good while I was making them and then people would read them and they wouldn't be blown away and then I'd think, why is that? And then I'd read it myself sort of six months later when I had some distance and I'd think like, this is really not good. <laughs> and at the time I thought it was good. But, but going through that, it, it makes you learn and you think, well, why isn't it good? And it's like, well, often I would put too many ideas into a comic or a page and there'd be too much happening and it would all get a bit lost so and i've learned to sort of like you know pair things down to their simplest and most powerful form over the years so um, and you're always learning you're always everything you do you evaluate it and you learn from it and i do that all the time i'm always looking at what i did in the past and what i've done you know last month and thinking like okay well how could I do that better this month? And that's uh, part of the excitement, I think, of being a, a creative person is you never stop learning. You're always finding out new stuff and discovering better ways of doing things. So that's, um, that's all part of the fun. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And then the fact you have the younger generation with you currently, and hopefully they'll be creative in whatever they choose to do, whether it's writing, art, or Maybe it's something that we don't even know about yet. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? How can the younger generation inspire the generation after them? Yes. Oh, that's an interesting one. I've not thought about that before. Um, I guess just by, by being true to themselves and by making the absolute greatest thing that they can make by being sort of um, passionate about it. I think the things that inspire people are things that are pure, that haven't been diluted. And increasingly, just with the way the world has developed and the ease with which you've got different channels to get creative projects to people digitally or through like, you know, small press printing or small print on printing, um, print on demand or whatever it might be you don't have to compromise and you don't have to fit into some preconceived notion of what a comic should be or what a story should be or what's successful. It's kind of like this balance because you've got to still respect what I was saying before about learning and listening to people. But at the same time, I think what people, why, what people want from a comic or a creative work is a real passion and a real vision. And you've got to just not compromise on that. Make sure that's the heart of what you're doing. I think kids do that naturally. I noticed that with um, my own kids and the kids that she she's sort of interacting with at school and stuff is that they're very, very, very passionate about stories that they're writing or games that they're playing or pictures that they're drawing. And, and um, they've got a very, very clear vision of what it should be. And if you, as an adult, come in and start saying it should be different or you're playing a game with them and you play it wrong in their mind and they get quite angry because it's like, no, it's like this. And, and so I think <clears throat> that is part of the fun of storytelling and it's part of the play of it um, that everybody has when they're a kid. And you've got to try and stay true to that, I think, and keep your particular vision and your particular way of doing things and your particular take on the world because ultimately that's what's interesting, I think, about different stories, because there are only so many stories. What is interesting is like the character and the personality and the ideas that you bring to to a story. So, um, yeah, that's probably how to do it. Well, I do hate to say this, Monty, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It was very interesting. I wasn't expecting to get into these deep areas. But before I let you go, though, how can we support you? Where can we find you on social media? And uh, the Kickstarter is ongoing until what day? Uh, December the 1st is when it, it ends. It's quite a short campaign because, like I said, I wanted to focus on making the comic rather than um, selling it. So if you, if you uh, want to check it out, do so quickly. It's Death Sentence Liberty is what this series is called. One to five is the title of the Kickstarter campaign, but you can get every single Death Sentence book on that campaign, including Death Sentence London with Martin Simmons, who is uh, another great collaborator, a great artist, most famous for doing Images Department of Truth, which is a very 
very good comic and very popular at the moment. So he's done nine issues. We did nine issues together. And like, similarly, as we were saying earlier, I was just totally blown away with his art and thinking like, wow, this guy's a star and I can't believe that he's working with me. Why hasn't anybody else snapped him up? And sure enough, it wasn't long before he was working on some of the biggest comics in the world. So some great painting and some great storytelling from him in the De Death Sentence universe. Death Sentence, which is the first book, which is with Mike Dowling. And that's, um, that's the one that kind of um, really broke through and sold a lot of copies and enabled us to sort of keep making it for, for years to come. Yeah, if people are able to check that out and just see if they like it, that would be fantastic. And the link's down below too. It's a shortened link for your Kickstarter campaign. So that, that works out well for Thanks you. Thanks a lot, man. No, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.